Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here this Thursday evening, live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake. We're also being seen live at, uh, live at SPNN in St. Paul, and we're glad to have you aboard. Um, this show will, uh, man, family law is the issue, and our courts is the issue in this show. And if you watched my show last week, I have some corrections to make and some updates on the uh, Grazzini Rucky case. And uh, it's pretty disturbing, to say the least, uh, what's going on there. So uh, stay tuned for my corrections and the updates. But uh, you're going to want to hear this story some more. It just keeps unfolding. And, you know, and especially you're going to want to hear about the missing children. Where are they? Where are these two kids? Uh, evidently, nobody knows, and they're on the missing and exploited child list. And we'll show you that here later in the show, uh, which is something I, for some reason, I did not understand. I did not grasp. Um, I knew they were missing. I knew that they were, um, uh, that uh, Sam. Uh, Grazzini Rocky did not know uh, where they were, but I assumed that somebody did. And what I am understanding now is that no, nobody knows where they are. And so this is uh, really, really serious, uh, to say the least. But before we get into that, uh, I got an announcement here. And yes, in the control room, uh, let's play that one when I say that video. Uh, because that's one of the things I have to correct. I got the name of a judge wrong uh, as to who was acting up in court, uh, telling jokes that were out of line. But so many of the judges, as I've heard and seen uh, in Dakota County, uh, have this type of behavior. Um, it's understandable, the confusion that I had. Uh, <clears throat> Parents, uh, here's an announcement. We talk a lot about Common Core and the effect that we'll have on your family and on your children relating to the curriculum. Uh, uh, so if you want to find out about that, a local parent education group is hosting a presentation and discussion of Common Core curriculum rec recently instituted into our schools. Now, I, I believe White Bear Lake has it. I'm not sure about um, uh, 622, which would be Oakdale, Maplewood area. Um, and at least 12 school districts have this common core. Uh, there is a lot of news and controversy about the state standards initiative. This is free to the public at Maplewood Library it will be Tuesday, May 27th at 7 p.m. So if you want to find out about Common Core, how it's going to affect you as a parent and as it affects you as a children, as a child, you need to go this Tuesday, May 27th at 7 p.m. at the Maplewood Library. This is, um, this is critical uh, because I think it's part of the setup to take away not only your parental rights, uh, but also to teach your kids about sexually deviant behavior such as sodomy. Uh, this is a health issue. We've discussed this on the show in the past. Uh, it's also to take away your religious liberties. In my opinion, after this legislative season is over and the enactment dates of these laws come into effect, we have established Minnesota as if it was the Third Reich. The same beginning issues that happen in the Third Reich are happening here in Minnesota. The teachers are the brown shirts. Uh, they're coming in and um, they're, they're, they have these control uh, climate, and they're called climate centers, and will be, you know, it just the, the intrusion into speech and into your life will be unbelievable. And you as a parent will not have a, uh, do not have to be notified about your children re receiving psychological counseling, receiving, um, 
due process rights. Won't have those due process rights either. You as a parent will not know what your child is going through and what the school isn't doing to your child and indoctrinating your child with in private sessions. So it's really bad. Now, uh, I didn't bring the piece of paper with me, but the other issue that I'm hearing is now the FBI will be coming in and monitoring the principals, making sure the principals are applying the Common Core uh, curriculum correctly. It's called, uh, the acronym is PAM, PAM, uh, Principal Advisory Management, something to that effect. Um, that's not exactly what it is. It could be, but I, I don't believe it is. And these principals will, could be under trouble if they're not implementing Common Core the way it's supposed to be by the FBI. So uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. Um, better watch out for it. So Tuesday, we got the date there, May 27th, Maplewood Library, 7 p.m., uh, a parent education group hosting this event. So get to, get to that if you can. Uh, it, it would be good. Um, I, you know, I've really never seen anything much worse than, well, let me start with this. First of all, if you have any comments or questions, please call into the show, 651-747-3838. One thing, if you're watching in St. Paul, I want to know if your volume's okay. We've had a couple call-ins that have said, hey, the volume isn't real good in, in, in uh, the city of St. Paul. We've got to turn our volume way up. So we want to make an adjustment on that. So let us know, but then you also have to call SPNN. And actually in the control room, if you can get that phone number for them uh, ready in, in case somebody does call in on the volume adjustment, that, that would be good. Um, okay. There's a term that's going to be used, and that term, you know, whenever you hear this term, you're going to think of something else, and you should say something else. So when you hear the word Benghazi, you should hear Hillary. So, you know, Benghazi, Hillary, you know, it's just something, you know, if somebody else says Benghazi, you need to say Hillary. They're, they're inseparable, in, in my opinion. This is, in and uh, Hillary Clinton was instrumental in prosecuting, in my understanding, in dealing with prosecution of uh, the Watergate. She knows the system. She knows how to uh, work the system. And I just believe that she is instrumental in this. She knows what she is doing is wrong and has been wrong. In, in, in my opinion, and I think it's critical what's going on in Benghazi and the investigation that's going to take place. Uh, it will destroy her run for the presidency. They, they won't be able to recover from it, and you just need to say Benghazi Hillary. You know, <laughs> at any time out there, uh, I just don't think she's uh, uh, fit to be president because of uh, the act actions and activity that she did or did not do that she should have done. But we got a video of the prosecutor, and I've, I've watched Trey Gowdy on this. Uh, he's going to be now the prosecutor for the House. He's a House of Representatives uh, from the 4th Congressional District in uh, what state? Um, oh, I wish it was Minnesota. <laughs> That's for sure. I wish it was from the 4th Congressional District in Minnesota here. He is a fantastic person, just a brilliant person, uh, and a man of character uh, beyond that. Uh, I wish we had somebody like that in our 4th Congressional District here in Minnesota. I think he's California. I'm not positive. It, it may be Oklahoma, but I think he's California. But anyway, we're going to watch him at a press conference he had where he kind of laid out What's he, what he's going to do, how he's going to do it, and what questions he's going to ask. But the big thing here, he's asking the press, and he's basically telling the press, why aren't you asking these questions? How come you're not pursuing trying to get these answers? So we'll watch and hear what uh, Trey Gowdy has to say. 
Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, we will not waver in our commitment to see that justice is done for this terrible act in Benghazi. And make no mistake, justice will be done. That was the President of the United States over a year ago. We're investigating exactly what happened, but my biggest priority now is bringing those folks to justice. That was the President of the United States over a year ago. No one has been arrested. No one has been prosecuted. No one has been brought to justice. We don't even have access to the witnesses. You and the media were good enough uh, for my 16 years as a prosecutor not to tell me how to do my job. And so far in Congress, y'all have been good enough not to tell me how to do my job. I'm not telling you how to do your job. But I'm going to ask you some questions. And if you can't answer these questions, then I'll leave you to draw whatever conclusion you want to draw about whether or not the media has provided sufficient oversight. Can you tell me why Chris Stevens was in Benghazi the night that he was killed? Do you know? Does it bother you whether or not you know why Chris Stevens was in Benghazi? Do you know why we were the last flag flying in Benghazi after the British had left and the Red Cross had been bombed? Do you know why requests for additional security were denied? Do you know why an ambassador asking for more security days and weeks before he was murdered and those requests went unheeded? Do you know the answer to why those requests went unheeded? Do you know why no assets were deployed during the siege? And I've heard the explanation, which defies logic, frankly that we couldn't have gotten there in time, but, but you know they didn't know when it was going to end. So how can you possibly cite that as an excuse? Do you know whether the president called any of our allies and said, can you help? We have men under attack. Can you answer that? Do any of you know why Susan Rice was picked? The Secretary of State did not go. She says she doesn't like Sunday talk shows. That's the only media venue she does not like if that's true. Why was Susan Rice on the five Sunday talk shows? Do you know the origin of this mythology that it was spawned as a spontaneous reaction to a video? Do you know where that started? Do you know how we got from no evidence of that to that being the official position of the administration? In conclusion, Congress is supposed to provide oversight. The voters are supposed to provide oversight. And you were supposed to provide oversight. That's why you have special liberties, and that's why you have special protections. Uh, I am not surprised that the President of the United States called this a phony scandal. I'm not surprised that Secretary Clinton asked, what difference does it make? I'm not even surprised that Jay Carney said Benghazi happened a long time ago. I'm just surprised at how many people bought it. All right, that's, uh, wow, uh, very, very powerful statement there. So why was Chris Stevens in Benghazi? You know, I don't know, but we do know he was there with virtually no support, uh, very, very little security forces, uh, just a few hired hands, local f hired hands, uh, who had a questionable reputation themselves. And my understanding from what I've heard uh, may have been in on the attack. Uh, this was no surprise uprising uh, because of a video. Uh, it's, it's quite more uh, extensive than that. Um, why were we there at all uh, after so many countries had left and the risk level was so high? And why wasn't he given the security that he asked for over and over again? But I also liked what he had to say because he was asking those of the press, why aren't you asking those questions? You're, you're not asking those questions. You need to ask them. Do your job. You as a press have special liberties and protection so that you can provide oversight. 
And, of course, that's what we try to do on this show with our judiciary. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, of course, we are not a funded press here on this show. Uh, rely a lot of information on what people give me and my, my own research. There is no staff. Um, but for these places that have people at the White House and all over the country and are making millions of dollars in revenue off of what billions of dollars in revenue off of what they do, why aren't they asking these questions? It, it's, uh, it, it's amazing to me. This is far worse and will be far worse than Watergate ever, ever was. It doesn't even come close. Watergate doesn't come close to what this is. And it's just sad. Let's get to the truth. Let's understand what's taking place. This is about uh, this is about transparency in our government and getting to know what they're doing. Uh, and basically, um, Trey didn't say it. Representative Gowdy didn't say it. But the press has abdicated their responsibility or advocated their constitutional role in this matter to investigate. So, uh, not, not surprising at all. But I have another um, video that I want you to watch because it uh, was that he, uh, Trey Gowdy was asked on a, a TV show. This was on uh, MSNBC with Morning Joe. But uh, it's a good interview to watch. I mean, Trey Gowdy just presents himself very well and does a super job with what he has to say. Um, but the la this is the last question that was asked him in the interview. But go to MSNBC Morning Joe, and uh, it was at 5.17 p.m., probably Eastern Time. So you can look in there uh, to see the interview, the full interview. But let's just hear the last question and how because people are going to try to politicize this. The Republicans are going to try to politicize it. The Democrats are going to try to politicize it. You know, both sides are going to try to make money. But Trey Gowdy, Gowdy himself has just said, I, I don't want a part of that. I'm going to get you the information. Well, let's hear what he has to say. That, to me, transcends politics. Yeah, hey, Trey, one final question. Yesterday, some people were bringing up around the set concerns that you could have a committee that could ha have one subpoena after another subpoena going out all the way through 2016, going after Hillary Clinton, going into the election campaign. Do you think there should be a limit on how long uh, the subpoena power should be for the committee, a limit to the scope so people don't say, hey, you Republicans, you're just doing this to go after Hillary? Well, part of the answer to that depends upon how compliant the administration is with our subpoena. Uh, it would be shame on us if we intentionally drug this out for political expediency. On the other hand, if an administration is slow walking document production, I can't end a trial simply because the defense won't cooperate. <coughs> right. I, I mean, there, there's a mutual obligation here. The only thing I can tell you is you go back and look at my 16 year career as a prosecutor and you're going to find defense attorneys that say, look, I thought my client was innocent, but the guy gave me a fair trial, and I pride myself on that. You can say whatever else you want. He's not smart, his suit doesn't match, bad haircut. No one will tell you I'm not fair, and at the end of this, I think you'll say the same thing. Now, let me just say, I followed your career, and uh, I do wonder about the haircut. <laughs> I do wonder about the haircut. No, it's a good suit, it's a good haircut, and he's a very <laughs> smart guy. But I'll tell you what, the, uh, Southern politicians do that better than anybody else. I, you know, I'm, I'm just, just a, a simple country simple lawyer. Simple country lawyer. Uh, Trey is anything but that. Trey, thank you so much for being with us. Greatly appreciate it. Good luck getting to the thank bottom you. of what really happened on September 11th. All right. That was Trey Gowdy. We'll see how he does. You know, and um, I, I just think he's the type of person that's going to give the facts out and then get the facts out there. You're going to be able to hear what people are saying, what people are doing, and then you get to, you're going to get to decide for yourself uh, what's taking place. And of course, so will the um, uh, so will the um, House of Representatives. I'm sure they're going to come to some type of decision with this. Well, okay, I want to remind you this is a live call-in show, so please feel free to call in with your comments or questions on any of these issues. Uh, also, uh, if you 
don't like calling in, there's my email, speechlessmn at gmail.com. And you can watch past videos at youtube.com backslash speechlessmn. And I'm more than happy. Matter of fact, if you even want to come on the show, you know, and want to see a debate or, you know, whatever you want to see, give me the information. But even you yourself, you want to come on the show, let me know. You know, and of course, you know, I'm looking for subjects regarding the judiciary, uh, family law, and, uh, you know, education, family rights. i uh, love to have uh, your opinion, and, you know, we'll go from there. So let me know. Okay, um, we have to get to this uh, Sandra Grazzini Rucky case, this divorce uh, situation, Sandra and David. Uh, just a really tough, tough situation going on here for all parties. Uh, and, I, you know, we need to pray for the family, for the kids, uh, because this, this, these are life and death situations that are taking place uh, in, in my mind. These are the type of things where uh, people crack and don't make it. Um, the, the pressure on, on all sides uh, can become unbearable to, to some people. And it's, um, it's not good. And when the government and our judiciary um, is intent on destroying people and destroying families themselves and have an attitude of, I don't care, you created this problem, you're bringing it before me, I, I just don't care. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it worse for you. And I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've sat in a courtroom and a judge says, if you're going to make me make a decision, both of you are not going to like it. Really? Is that the way you're going to be? You know, and to me, the type of judge that says that type of thing, and you know you're out there if you're a judge watching this that says that kind of garbage, you're not a good judge. You're not a good person. Um, you understand that everybody that comes in that courtroom, people are not, in general, just good people. Everybody, including yourself as a judge. And what we're trying to do is raise people up, lift them up, give them encouragement, not destroy them. And, but I don't think that's the attitude of our judiciary. I don't, I don't think that's their mindset. Um, so, this, this is a tough deal all the way around. And I haven't told you half the stuff. One, because I don't have all the time. And the other part is, try, how do I present it? How do I get it all to you? And actually, this should be on a documentary. But boy, we can do a, a, a week-long documentary on this case alone in the various avenues that it has gone down. Uh, in rabbit trails and various things like that. But in the bottom line, right now, we got two kids missing, and nobody knows where they are. And I haven't heard an outcry in the press, but I was, it was brought to my attention. And Sandra uh, told me, my, my kids are missing, and I don't know where they are. Well, I took that I don't know where they are as... Um, Somebody knows, uh, her ex-husband knows, or somebody in her family knows, but she, since she's the non-custodial parent, hasn't been told. That's how I took it as. But here's what I found out, is this is the, uh, uh, what's this website here? Uh, forget the exact name. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And if you've, I, I know you've heard of that. They do the Amber Alerts. But when you go on there and you're from Minnesota, this is what's going to come up here. And if you look here under the right, Guiana or Gianna Rucky and Samantha Rucky are missing from Lakeville, Minnesota, April 19, 2013. And then you may say, well, this is a divorce situation, you know, probably somebody in the family has them. No, our understanding is nobody knows where they are. Okay, and so have they been abducted? Well, that, that's the implication here. But here's uh, 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 
Gianna, I don't know if I'm saying that right, uh, missing since April 19th, 2013 from Lake, uh, Lakeville, Minnesota. Uh, female, race white, color hair brown, eye color brown, 5'8", about 145 pounds. So age 14 now, gone, missing. Don't know where she's at. Uh, then we can look for her sister, Samantha, age 15. Brown hair, brown eyes, 5'6", 130 pounds. Nobody knows. Uh, court doesn't know. Nobody knows. Here's an interesting thing, and here's a, some corrections I have to make on this. Um, one correction is about the judge. I'm not going to do that right now. Uh, the judge I said last week was not the judge. Well, it wasn't in this case. I was talking about another case where I named the wrong judge. So I'll do that one a little later. But what's happened is Sandra Grazzini got the kids in a court order, full custody, legal and physical. Her husband went and asked for then full custody, full legal. The case was reopened, and he ended up getting the kids full uh, legal and, and um, physical custody. And so since then, there's been an ongoing court process where party were, at least in this case, the mom hasn't been notified of a lot of the motions, ex parte, a lot of the and orders coming out without hearings. And some 89 motions plus some over 3,000 orders, not separate orders, but, you know, an order will have a number of orders in them over 3,000, uh, unbelievable amount. And so the judge j then just this last year, uh, November 25th about then, uh, came up with an order and said, okay, uh, here's who gets the kids. And the father again kept uh, physical and legal custody uh, <clears throat> after that hearing. but. Since he had it anyway, it was in his preference, but there was no hearing, evidentiary hearing, to uh, get them the kids in the first place. Well, he, here's the deal. The father uh, could not take care of the kids, and so he handed them off to his sister, Tammy Love. And I implied last week that Tammy Love was married because I said Mrs. Love. She's not married. Uh, Tammy has two children of her own. They were taken away permanently when they were little from Tammy Love. Okay, now <clears throat> I'm going to bring in a different aspect, kind of go into Tammy Love's family. Uh, Tammy's daughter is an unwed mother who is on full welfare. Uh, so you got the food stamps, you know, MFIB. Um, and her name is Jennifer Pitcher. And Jennifer is living at one of her uncles, or in this case, David Rocky, the father of, the, of, of Sanders' kids, um, at home, at, living at one of their homes. Okay. Anne is receiving housing payments towards this home on all her assistant paperwork. So she's receiving money and it's going to this home. Now, Tammy, her mother, is also claiming the same home on different per paperwork, on a different assistance number, and also receiving housing payments. In essence, uh, the home is being paid by two, uh, by the state, uh, two different payments for a home ne that neither reside in, just the tip of the fraud that they're doing. You, you got to understand this. There, um, this is David's home, okay? Uh, the brother and the uncle uh, to these two people. Tammy now has custody of David's kids. Okay, so David Rucky got full custody, 
legal and physical custody of his children, and now Tammy Ruckey has custody of the kids. How that took place, David wasn't taking care of the kids, or he, I, I don't know that he wasn't taking care of them, he gave them over to foster care. Okay, that's, the, that's a big thing to understand here. They had to go to foster care. Foster care has to do a family search. Didn't notify everybody. Didn't notify uh, Sandra Ruckey that her kids were going into foster care. That gets her an opening to go and get her children back. And uh, in foster care, the kids end up with Tammy Love, David's sister. Okay, who prior had lost her two own children, had been taken away uh, years earlier. So now you got these two fam two people, Tammy Love and Jennifer uh, Pitcher, living in the same house, collecting assistance um, for two different situations, and David Rocky now is not taking care of his kids, but his sister is, and his sister is receiving federal uh, state money to take care of David and Sandra's kids. You see the scam going on here? Uh, now, Sandra Ruckey owes child support to David, but that all changed because the child support has been redirected to Tammy Love. Well, in order to redirect child support, even according to child support workers, under Minnesota Statutes 518A.46, Subdivision 7E, no support will be redirected pending the hearing and issuance of an order. Okay, so there had to have been a hearing and there had to have been an order in order for this to take place. But guess what? From all we're understanding, well, there's no hearing, definitely. There could be an order out there. Where is it? But where's the hearing? Why weren't all the parties notified in the hearing? Even though you don't have legal custody and physical custody, you still have a right to know what's going on with your children. Uh, <clears throat> which is really a big problem in our court system with families, is that essentially if you have your physical custody and legal custody taken away, you've essentially had your parental rights terminated without due process. It's a, you have that constitutional right to raise your children. You have rights, and they're high rights. And all of a sudden, you're kicked out of the door by an order for a judge, and there's no jury. There's no hearing. Uh, it's, it's amazing to me. And now they're in foster care and with somebody else. Okay. So even though the child support is now being going to Tammy Love instead of David Ruckey, Tammy Love is getting a lot more money in, as a foster care parent than Sandra can pay. But while Sandra had custody of the kids, David Ruckey owed child support to Sandra, but David never paid any child support to Sandra, and they're going after Sandra for lack of child support payment to David, and the amount she owes doesn't even come close to the amount that David owed. So why aren't you crossing these off? And just saying, okay, uh, he owed this much, you know, it was around ten thousand he hadn't paid on, and now she owes this much, about four thousand plus. Well, she still got about five thousand five hundred to make up, you know, before she really owes anything. But that's not what's happening. They're coming after her for not paying her child support money. This whole thing just smells and just stinks to high heaven. I mean, there, there's something really raunchy and shaky going on here. Um, okay, so these two kids went missing. Um, 
Samantha and Gianna went missing the day they were supposed to go over to Tammy Love. This is April 19, 2013. That's the day those two older kids went missing. The younger three kids showed up, but the older two didn't. And nobody knows where they are. Uh, I suspect, you know, I don't know. Somebody's got to know where they are. This just seems too devious that they, nobody in either of the families, and significantly, significant families with money. These are not poor families. Um, some people in the families are poor, but some are very, 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 very wealthy. And to have a relative show up on missing and exploited children and not do anything and no police search. Now, I mean, this is a question somebody was asking me, has a police search happened? And my understanding is no police search has happened. Uh, nobody, my understanding, is looking into this. Um, so th this is big. Well, in the process of appealing the December, November 25th um, hearing decision by uh, Judge David Knudsen in Dakota County, an appeal was filed in this case and uh, to go to the appellate court. Now when you file an appeal, you have to notify the parties to the case. And in this case, the parties are definitely David Grazini, the father, and you got to notify the court. Beyond that, there has to be other things happen so that there'd be other parties, and a guardian ad litem could be another party to the case, but not necessarily. And a guardian ad litem is a person who's supposed to watch out for the best interest of the child, and guardian ad litems were appointed to this case, some have removed themselves, and others have come on. But what happens in this process, they come on and off. And I'm just going to read you some of the rules, at least one of the rules here, as to <clears throat> whether a guardian ad litem is party to a case or not. Oh, boy, I think I just lost my, my spot. Uh, guardian ad litems. This is... Under general rules of practice, number three, find it here, th uh, section 302.02b, appointment of a guardian ad litem for minor children is governed by the rules of guardian ad litem procedure in juvenile and family court. The guardian ad litem shall carry out the responsibility set forth in the rules of guardian ad litem procedures in juvenile and family court. The guardian ad litem shall have the rights set forth in the rules of guardian ad litem procedure in juvenile family court. A guardian ad litem for minor children may be designated a party to the proceedings in the order of appointment. If the child is made a party to the proceedings, then the child's guardian ad litem shall also be made a party. Now here's what it's saying. It's saying that a guardian ad litem may be a party to any appellate process or any suit. And that being made a part, being party, means they need to be notified of any legal procedures or events that are going to take place. Keyword there is may. Doesn't always have to happen because they may not be a party because an appeal may not deal with them at all. And a guardian ad litem is appointed by the court in district court, and usually after they're, they've uh, done their work, they're dismissed. They're off the case. Okay, they're no longer the guardian ad litem, which Every guardian ad litem in this case, in my understanding, has been dismissed. 
They're not part of the case anymore. <clears throat> okay, these are the rules. Now, if the child is made part of the proceeding, which they weren't in this case, otherwise they're named. This is between David and Sandra Rucky in, in dealing with their kids and, and the court. If the guardian item, if the children become part of the party in this lawsuit and that they get a say, then the guardian ad litem also becomes party, and then they would need to be noticed. Um, a guardian a, a guardian appointed pursuant to Minnesota Statute Section 257.6 becomes a party to the action if the child is made a party. The guardian then would be entitled to initiate and respond to motions, conduct discovery, call and cross-examine witnesses, make oral or written arguments or reports, and appeal on behalf of a child without the necessity of applying to the court. A guardian appointed under Minnesota Statute Section 518.156 is not a party to the proceedings and may only initiate and respond to motions and make oral statements and written reports on behalf of the child. A party has the right to cross-examine as an adverse witness, that's a key word, adverse witness, uh, the author of any report or recommendation on custody and visitation of a minor child. Okay, so what the court said in this order is that the guardian ad litem, the time had run out, and they were not noticed. So therefore, the appeal of the custody and everything that all the garbage in my opinion, that went on in David Knudsen's court is unappealable. So they're saying that the guardian ad litem wasn't noticed. I'm going to give you some other time dates here. Okay, the appeal was filed January 24, 2014. Okay, the court is saying the appeal period expired on January 24, 2014, the same day the appeal was filed, which was 60 days after judgment was entered on November 25th. Okay, and this was considered by the court that this was timely served and by mails on the attorneys representing David Rucky in Dakota County. So the court is saying here, this has all been timely served on David Rucky and the court. Okay. And then they go on to say, it is undisputed that appellant did not serve the notice of appeal on the GAL within the appeal period. So they're saying that GAL was not served on the 24th. The 24th is an okay day to serve, uh, but the guardian ad litem didn't get served notice. Now, the attorney in this case, Michelle McDonald, is saying, no, the guardian ad litem was not party to this case. The kids were not party. Um, the guardian ad litem was not party, and we're not addressing any guardian ad litem issues. We're issue, de, uh, dealing, dealing with the legal rulings of David Knudsen and the behavior of David Knudsen in the courtroom. That's what we're appealing. The guardian ad litem has nothing to do with this. So, but the court is saying they weren't timely served, or they're not saying they weren't timely served. The court is saying it is undisputed that the appellant did not serve the notice on the GAL. And so they go through this whole legal reasoning why the guardian ad litem needs to be served. <clears throat> and, you know, I, don't, I didn't have time to go through all these orders, but I'm kind of going through this process because the big deal is coming down the road. Um... It's a jurisdictional requirement that it takes place, and the court says, gives all this reasoning why, in this case, the guardian ad litem needs to be served. Okay, so now you're sitting there <clears throat> getting this order yesterday. Uh, actually, two days ago, it's filed yesterday. 
you're getting this order and you're an attorney and you just realizing here the court's saying you lost your appeal rights on everything, whether it had to do with the guardian item or not, you lost your total appeal rights. So what I'm looking at here and what I'm seeing is that the court did not even read what the appeal right was just because the guardian ad litem wasn't noticed and they think they need to be, everything is out the door, which is not right. That is wrong. And if our justice system is doing this, that's just wrong. It's immoral uh, that that would happen. I can see where they can say, okay, you lose your guardian ad litem appeals and anything the guardian ad litem did, that's out the door. We won't discuss that. That appeal is gone. I can see them doing that. But to lose everything else that has no relationship to the guardian ad litem, uh, I, I, they, need, they needed to sort that out in the appellate court. Uh, or, yeah, they needed to sort it out there. Now, instead, this, now this appeal is going to go straight to the Supreme Court here in Minnesota. But here's the interesting kicker in all this. And this is the big deal. Uh, I got this from attorney in the case, and it says, we are in receipt of your order May 13. This is according to the, uh, this was sent to the appellate court. Here's who it was considered by. And it was interesting, it was a three judges that considered this, because there was no hearing about this case. There was nobody saying, you can come up and talk about it. This was just... They, they get together, they look at the papers and decide this. Somebody filed a motion, Michelle filed a motion back, and, but Judge, Chief Judge Clear, Cleary, Chief Judge, uh, or Judge Kirk, and Judge Smith. Of course, it doesn't have their first name in there in case there's a couple of Smiths, so you don't know who it is. I mean, this is the part of the courts, come on, gets here. Now, there may be only one Smith, so then they didn't have to do that, but you know, what if there's a Smith from 10 years ago? You don't know if that Smith is still on the bench and a new one. Put their names in there. This is ridiculous. Come on. And I believe on the Republican Party platform, they're put in a, uh, a plank and probably will come down here in May that will say that exact thing. Every judge must sign their order that they're agreeing to, and their name has to be on it. But instead, we just have... Uh, judge Edward Cleary signing this. Uh, none of the other judges. Of course, it was written by Cleary. He should sign it, but the other judges' full name should be on there uh, so that you know who they are. I'm really disappointed in Judge Kirk. I'm beginning to start liking him and some of his questions and decisions, but that's starting to go out the door now. Um, so, those were the judges, the appellate court judges in this case. Um, the guardian ad litem, Mr. Jerbuck, this is according to Michelle McDonald, was well aware of an order dated July 17, 2011, that the guardian ad litem was permissive and not a party to the underlying action. Whoops, there goes that May. It was permissive and not a party. In addition, the July, 2000, uh, July 17, 2011 order dismissed the guardian ad litem more than once by various court orders. Contrary to Mr. Jarabek's representations in the above court findings, there is no order expressly making the guardian ad litem party, making the guardian ad litem a party. Attorney John Jarabek was dishonest when he represented to the above court that the guardian was not served with the notice of appeal. Attached, that's a big statement there, was not honest when he was not e-served with the notice of appeal. Attached is the e-service document showing he was e-served on behalf of the guardian on January 24th, 2014, which is a day that you could be served, was, which is still on the timeline. So he's e served on January 24th, 2014, with the notice of appeal and statement of the case, 
and that he opened the e-service on January 26, 2014. Even though we took the position that the guardian ad litem was not a party, had been dismissed, and was not necessarily, and it was not necessary to serve, we serve the guardian anyways, contrary to Mr. Jerabek's uh, uh, assertions. So what do you do now? You know, is that enough notice to, uh, for the appellate court to change their mind? Is that the evidence? that was there. Uh, so a question comes up, was this uncontested? Was the motion by the court, uh, by the guardian ad litem, was that motion uncontested? Well, no, it wasn't uncontested. All they have to do and all the court, appellate court officers had to go is look in the timeline and go look in the e-service. But they didn't do it. But yet they have the audacity to say it is un, where's that page here? Um, it is undisputed. It didn't say uncontested. It is undisputed that appellant did not serve notice of appeal on the GAL with the appeal period, within the appeal period. But they give no evidence as to why it's undisputed. <clears throat> all, they could, all they had to do is look on the e-service thing and to look and see that the guardian ad litem opened up the case and looked at it on the 26th. It's not when you open it up, it's when you get it. That's the issue. Well, this is uh, quite disturbing <laughs> in, in, in the case and it just adds another whole extra dimension to this case that's going on that just keeps deep keeps getting deeper and deeper I've never seen anything like this I've seen things very close I've seen a similar situation not related to relatives but to as I talked on last week where some kids ended up dying in the process uh, it was just tragic upon all tragedies that but people scamming the system again. This is the same type of scamming that I've seen before. But who do you go to? Court doesn't care. You can go to the Attorney General. They don't care. We've done that type of stuff before. Uh, you go to the county attorney. Uh, you know what? You're, you're asking political people, not political people, executive branch people, because everybody's political. That's a wasted word now. It means nothing. You have to say it's a legislative issue, it's an executive branch issue that these county attorneys are not looking into this, they're not finding out what's going on, they're, uh, they're leaving this alone when they've been warned over and over. And I have to tell you, I was on the phone asking questions um, and uh, with uh, Sam Grazzini today and then I was talking with uh, uh, her attorney, McDonald, when Sam called in and the answer was hang up the phone and call 911 and she was talking to Sam and um, don't know really what's going on but my assumption or uh, and I heard a little bit before the phone call that her ex-husband had showed up at um, a location she was at with a shotgun and this is just uh, hearsay right now I gotta do further work and evidence and now uh, I was on the phone and heard that. Folks, uh, you know, we can't solve all the problems in the world. People have to be accounted for themselves. But when our legal system and our court system exacerbates the problem, gives this uncaring attitude of the lives of the people uh, around them that they have jurisdiction over and they, they destroy them, what do you expect? What do you expect to happen when you, when you make the system a cheap system and you have these judges with black robes disease that do whatever they want, ignore the laws, and strip people of, of their rights uh, without a care in the world? In my opinion, a, a number of these people don't care one bit at all. Uh, and they're, they're there for themselves and their own uh, goals in life. 
I don't know. What do you think? Uh, it's a pretty tragic deal. Well, we'll give you an update, update next week on what's going on. Uh, any further results from this? I got a lot more research to do. Um, there is no, um, a lot of this guardian ad litem stuff is built into case law. The rules are silent. Um, they're vague. And uh, of course, they, no law was cited in here. No statute was cited. This is all on how the court operates and you lose your kids. Um, so, and, and in this case, it wouldn't matter how good of an attorney you are. You did everything right. Everything was served right, and the court still finds a way to, you know, shove this away. And will they do that in the Supreme Court? Possibly. I mean, if they don't like you, if they don't do what you're, uh, what you want them to do, if you're fighting the system and exposing the problems in the court system, they don't like that. They make it known that you're not liked and what you're doing is not acceptable to them, so you better follow the party line here uh, in the judicial royalty, otherwise are you going to pay a price? And I think that's part of what's going on here. Uh, that's my opinion. I've seen this before. And, and it will continue to happen until somebody says no. And hopefully it's you, the people. Know your judges, know who's running for office, and get a good person in there. We'll keep you up to date on that in the future about who the good judges are going to be. All right, remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. Sets on fire